All right. Very good. So uh, thank you all for, for joining me tonight for Topics in Trauma Nursing. Uh, this is the fifth such uh, topic session that we've done. I started a little over a year ago. And you know, like I said, uh, for the for the live program tonight and in subsequent nights, you know, it's been a ha it's been a mixed bag of turnout. You know, usually a handful or so of people who come on uh, for the live part. But like I say, I'm recording this. We'll post it on my YouTube channel, and we generally get another twenty five or thirty, sometimes fifty people, depending on the topic. Um, and certainly, if if you like what we're discussing tonight and you find it to be entertaining and educational, try to do a little bit of both. Um, then certainly uh, chat it up to any of your colleagues. And like I said, I'll send you the link uh, after I post it, as well as anybody who registered and couldn't join us, we'll get a cop and we'll get a link. And, uh, you know, if you tell two friends about it and they tell two friends about it, it'll go viral. So again, welcome to the March 1st version of Topics in Trauma Nursing. Uh, my name is Steve Weinman, and I'm with the trauma program at St. Joseph's University Hospital in Patterson. I am uh, in charge of uh, trauma education, um, injury prevention there. Um, that's my full-time day job. My uh, other hats that I wear, in addition to working up at St. Joe's, is um, very active in the pre-hospital environment. Um, a, uh, I am the EMS Bureau Chief uh, with Somerset County Office of Emergency Management here in Somerset County. Um, as well as I write on a volunteer squad here in Somerville, where I am president of that agency, um, and, and do a couple of other things uh, in addition to serving on the editorial board for both the Journal of Emergency Nursing as well as the Journal of Special Operations Medicine. Um, so like I say, I'm thrilled uh, to have you here tonight. I do have nothing to disclose, although I wish I did. And then uh, the requisite, uh, the comments and views that are expressed tonight are those of me and do not reflect the opinion of any of my agencies, organizations, and our employers. So uh, we'll get that out of the way so I don't get in trouble with uh, any of the uh, public relations people at the hospital. All right, so if you haven't joined in before and this is your first time joining into topics, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a quarterly educational opportunity that's designed to really bring cutting edge, hot topic items in trauma and emergency care to emergency and trauma nurses um, predominantly in New Jersey, but obviously this is going up on YouTube, so it could be just about anywhere. I've had a couple of nurses tune in from uh, across the pond uh, and a, the Asia Pacific area. So yeah, you know, anywhere, anywhere where you can pull up a YouTube page and you find something you like to watch, um, it's a possibility that, you know, you can be educating people just about anywhere. The goals are really pretty simple. I want you to sit back. I want you to enjoy, but I also want you to ask questions. And then ultimately, if you like what you see here tonight, uh, talk it up for the next session and I'll give you a little bit of a I'll do a little bit of an ad for that shortly and as well as at the end um, as I've already mentioned all two all of these sessions are recorded and they're available on YouTube and I'll send out a link afterwards and like I said this is I think the fifth uh, version now of topics we've done a really decent cross-section of other uh, topics uh, that you might want to tune into uh, we've done uh, active shooter incidents and the concept of rescue task force in the pre-hospital environment and what emergency nurses need to know about that We've done uh, damage control resuscitation. Kathleen Robinson from uh, Robert Wood Johnson was nice enough to do uh, that talk. Uh, we did a talk most recently back in December on uh, the use of calcium in mass transfusion. And that was a lady by the name of Jessica Mills from North Carolina, who I uh, ran into at ENA's national conference last uh, fall down in Denver. And she was nice enough to come and do her talk again for us. So those talks and, and others that you'll find are, are up and posted on that YouTube channel. So I certainly invite you to go and uh, educate yourself, as we say. If you like tonight's session, then you will also love, I hope, the companion uh, program, which is Trauma Nursing Journal Club. Um, I do this particular session quarterly, but then I also do a journal club quarterly. And what I usually do is I try to find a decent article in the literature um, that has, uh, you know, reasonable impact um, for emergency and trauma nurses and uh, present it in a very non-threatening manner. Everyone's a little worried about, uh, you know, articles and, and going through studies and study design and things like that. But we take the minutiae out of it. And, and I do try to pick a cross section of articles that aren't very scientifically laden. Uh, sometimes they're as simple as we did one a uh, couple about six months ago um, that was published um, in the Journal of Trauma Nursing. Uh, some of the UPenn nurses in Philly uh, did a little rundown about how they handle uh, their their 
uh, private vehicle drive up uh, shootings um, and a whole protocol that they put together. They published a nice paper on it. So, again, that's also posted up on the YouTube channel as well. But, uh, you know, again, um, we do do this companion. And, and at the end, as you do your evaluation tonight, if you want to, to claim some CE credit, there'll be an opportunity on the form for you to check off that you want to be kind of put on my mailing list. And I will just keep you on my mailing list for future incarnations of both the Journal Club and Topics in Trauma Nursing. All right, I've already got the next uh, session planned. So if you are so inclined, um, it'll be held on June 7th, again at 8 p.m. These are usually Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Um, I took a poll a little over a year and a half ago, and nurses seem to like 8 p.m. on Wednesdays. So boom, there you go. Um, but this will be an interesting topic. This is going to be, this is titled uh, Gender Diverse and Transgender Patients, a Special Population in Trauma Care. And this is put on by a friend of mine, uh, Justin Melisi. Uh, Justin is a clinical editor for Elsevier, um, but he's also down in Dallas, Texas. He's had a very full minute career uh, in emergency and trauma nursing. And uh, he actually did this particular talk, I think it was three years ago at ENA's national conference. And he's in the process now of uh, putting this talk into a manuscript that I'm working with him on for the Journal of Emergency Nursing. So um, we all, if, if you've taken a, a TNCC course or an ATLS course, um, you know that there's special populations that we usually talk about the pediatric patient, the OB patient, the uh, obese patient. Uh, but this is an up and coming and I think a very interesting group that we should talk about. And that's the transgender patient and some of the implications that, uh, you know, they bring to the table when they come in um, after they've been injured. And again, it's an increasing population. And unfortunately, because of the nature, um, you know, of, of their orientation, they are unfortunately um, involved in a lot of altercations. And uh, if you haven't seen one yet in, in, in your emergency department or on your trauma table, um, you will eventually. So um, Justin's uh, nice enough to come in and he'll do that talk on June 7th. So thank him ahead of time. All right, here's the continuing education minutia. We'll get that out of the way. So uh, this is uh, approved for continuing nursing education credit by the Institute for Medical and Nursing Education. I've already mentioned that I have nothing to disclose. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, after this, uh, after the talk tonight, I'll provide you with a QR code on the screen that you can scan real quick if you get a QR code enabled device, or I'll pop in the chat box um, the link to the SurveyMonkey evaluation. You can complete it. I'll send you a certificate in the next couple of days. And then if you're interested, I'll add you to the emailing list for future sessions. Um, I would like to make tonight's talk interactive. I do realize the whole, so unfortunately, the whole schema of, of you know, these online programs is people like to shut their cameras down and mics off and, and listen, and, and that's totally fine. I don't want to make this all about Steve talking tonight. So I soon, certainly do encourage you to, uh, for the live audience, obviously YouTube, you can talk to yourself. Um, but I certainly uh, welcome you to, to pop on the mic. You don't have to turn on the camera if you don't want to. And, you know, ask questions or throw your own pearls of wisdom in for some of the uh, various eye emergencies, eye injuries that we'll talk about tonight. All right, so here we go. We're going to talk about ocular injuries. Uh, common or not so common. A lot of these are fairly common, and, and probably we, uh, the uh, group of us that are online tonight, have uh, run into these uh, at some point in time um, in, in, in our practice. But some of these are, are not, and uh, we should at least be somewhat uh, reticent of what they are. And you know, again, it's not a matter of if they'll come into the department or be trauma patients, but it's a matter of when. So we'll talk about a good cross-section tonight. And um, again, I'll entertain any questions or comments you have toward the end, or like I said, jump in at any time. All right. So you, you can't really talk about how to take care of patients or what to expect in taking care of patients with eye injuries, unless you know how to do your basic eye assessment. So uh, again, you can go on YouTube. I am, I am a big fan of YouTube. Um, my daughters have turned me onto it because they use it for just about everything. My younger daughter was having some issues with the car. She lives up in Providence, Rhode Island. And she called me one night and said, I'm having an issue where it was, I think it was putting antifreeze in the car. And I said, look, I, you know, I'll call you back in about 15 minutes. I was doing something and I'll teach you how to do it. And she called me back 10 minutes later and said, hey, don't worry about it. I just saw a YouTube video on it and I got it taken care of. And my other daughter who lives in Boston had the same issue with checking tires on her car. And again, YouTubed it and, you know, boom, before you know it, you don't need dad anymore. So um, 
in, in, in like fashion, there's a lot of good videos that are on the internet and on YouTube that talks about doing an eye assessment. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that to you to look at. But one is tangential to eye injuries. What are some of the things that we need to be considering? Uh, first and foremost, what's the history of the injury? Uh, no different than any other injury that we deal with in, in patients that come into the emergency department. Uh, what was the history of the injury? What was the mechanism of injury? Uh, what was what, what are we seeing when we do a gross visualization of that injured area? The patient comes in and they're complaining of being hit in the eye, or maybe they had a ball hit them in the eye, or they got a baseball bat across the mid face, you know, what is, what's your inspection? What are you seeing? You know, that, you know, get across the room view that we teach, you know, part of the trauma nursing process in TNCC. Do we see anything really ardently weird going on, you know, and, and kind of, you know, what is, what does that do with our gestalt? Um, obviously an assessment of visual acuity to the extent you can. And a lot of times it's going to be very simplistic or it could be a little bit more complex. Um, it could be just, you know, the general, you know, are there any changes in your vision? Since you got hit in the eye by the basketball, tell me what you're seeing. Is your vision blurrier? Are you seeing double vision? Are you seeing nothing at all? You know, kind of what's going on there. Or you can be a little bit more formal and you can do kind of the eye chart or what most of us do in triage, hold up the two fingers and am I holding up? How many fingers do you see, right? Um, at least you're getting a gross assessment of the fact that they can see, that they can see things, you know, decently. And then if it's out of focus or they're seeing four fingers and you're holding only holding up two and they're seeing double vision, it certainly tells us something is certainly going on with, with that eye. In addition to that, we got to put our hands on patients, right? So, uh, you know, palpate, especially when somebody comes in and they've got hit in the face or they've got hit around the orbital rims and they're complaining of pain. So the key there is to be very focused in your palpation of the midface, you know, palpate along the, the maxilla, palpate along the bridge of the nose, go up into the periorbital area, feel the, the, the cheeks, the zygoma, you know, see if they're having any pain, see if you feel things like bony crepitus, you feel some kind of a displaced bone, you feel a step off, you feel subcutaneous air. Um, I'll tell you, the, my favorite story, and maybe this is why I like eye injuries uh, as I do. Um, I was new grad in the ER, my first shift, first shift in the ER, and this was a pretty busy ER, they put me out of triage. Um, I don't know if they thought it was a joke, see if the new guy, the new grad sinks or swims or not. But literally one of the first couple of patients that I took care of was a, was, was a lady who came in about 22, 23 years old, uh, was a victim of domestic abuse. Her uh, significant other had hit her in the face. So she came in and I'm a new grad and I'm trying to be therapeutic. So I'm sitting her down and putting my hand on her shoulder and, and being empathetic and she's crying. So I give her a tissue and I say, here, here's a tissue. Go ahead and blow your nose and we'll chat. And she did that. She blew her nose. And just as soon as she blew her nose, boom, the whole side of her face blew up. And I went into total freak out. I mean, she looked like the elephant man sitting in front of me, whereas just a few minutes before she didn't. So, I mean, you know, I'm a new guy. I'm trying to think what's going on here. And of course my preceptor, very good after she kind of picked herself off the floor, you know, rolling on the floor. Um, we got her, took care of her. We got her back to a treatment area and I went and changed my scrubs. Um, but, uh, you know, she said, hey, you know, look, this is probably, she probably had an orbital blowout fracture. When you let her blow her nose and she blew her nose, the pressure, instead of blowing pressure out her nose, it blew up into her open orbit and she had a lot of sub-Q air. So that was <laughs> my first introduction to eye injuries and it's resonated with me ever since. So um, again, make sure that you look and you, you, you see what's going on. And certainly as we talk about some of the care and how we're taking care of these patients, one of the things will be, you know, don't let them cough. Don't let them sneeze to the extent we can. Don't give them a tissue and tell them to blow their nose. Um, because again, you could have strange things happen. Check their extraocular motion. We all learned this in our basic assessment course. Have them take a look at your finger and then follow it along the visual plane, up and down, and then follow it in the different visual planes and see if the eyes are tracking together. Um, if one eye is tracking differently than the other, then that could be indicative of a variety of different things going on, including possibly an orbital fracture with, with entrapment of uh, eye muscle. So important to do when it's appropriate to do so. Now we're going to talk about some eye injuries very shortly where you do not pass go, you do not collect $200 and you get them right into some level of intervention. And we'll talk about those in a minute. 
But to the extent that we can, the vast majority of eye injuries that do present to the ED, you're going to be able to do some level of physical assessment as part of your triage uh, assessment. And obviously prioritizing them correctly, because when we think about things that are priorities, we think about things that are life-saving, things that are limb-saving, and then things that are sight-saving. So it's in the top three of things that we will triage with a relatively high priority, depending on what our assessment findings are. Check intraocular pressure. And I don't know how often this is done anymore. I don't practice in the emergency department as part of my daily routine anymore, and I haven't for a while. But I do know back in the day, um, we, it's particularly in the emergency departments I worked in, and I was in St. Louis, Kansas City, and then New York City for a while, um, where, yeah, when we brought these patients back, um, we were getting intraocular pressures on them. Or in, in triage, uh, we had a Shiite tonometer that we would put on uh, the person if we suspected, again, with an eye injury to check their intraocular pressure. So that's something else we want to do. And we'll see that in a second here. Um, normal IOP is about between 10 and 20 millimeters of mercury. It's measured through uh, what's called tonometry. And tonometry has kind of evolved quite a bit in the 35 or so years since I started in my new grad days to triage desk. Um, you can see this particular device here on the left, that is called the Shiite tonometer, and that was one of the original tonometers that we used, and that's what I kind of grew up on, and I used probably the first couple of decades that I was that I was working in the ED, and it was really cool. You kind of will tell how old people are when they when they when they're smiling. I'm just probably I don't know, maybe I can't see you guys' faces. So I don't know your ages out there, but um, somebody is out there smiling when they look at this because if you remember how this thing came, it came in a nice black almost like a leather case and when you opened it up it sat in like velvet that had a cutout that it sat right down into this velvet cutout it was just now you think about it today it's just it's hilarious but that's how it was at the time um and you know we obviously progressed from that to the tono pen and then now we've gone to the air puff systems that are either handheld air puffers or they're tied into probably a slit lamp in the uh, in the EMT room if you have an EMT room in your in your emergency department. Um, we're going to also want to maybe assess IPH uh, for for certain injuries, and we'll talk about that when we talk about chemical exposures to the eye. It's very important that we look at IPH and monitor that. And then the slit lamp examination, and 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 probably all of us have been at the receiving end of a slit lamp, if you've ever gone to the eye doctor, um, most emergency, well, every emergency department I've ever been in, um, I assume every emergency department carries some carnation of a slit lamp uh, that you assess, uh, that the docs can use to assess uh, the anterior and posterior chambers of the eye. Um, so, um, and again, most of us have been on the receiving end. I'm wearing glasses. So, you know, for my entire life uh, on an annual basis, I've gone and had my eyes slit lamped. So uh, again, just kind of one of the many assessment tools for doing eye assessments in our departments. Some other interventions and basics we're going to consider is positioning, particularly if we got somebody who comes in, we think could have an injury to their eye, which could ca could cause some kind of some kind of bad injury to the globe, could have caused something where they've got increased intraocular pressure. We want to position them in a, a, a supine position. We want to have them um, seated. We want them to be, um, you know, have their head elevated and we want to do everything we can to keep pressure down from within the eye. And we'll tell them, please don't blow your nose, as I found out pretty early on, um, you know, try to minimize sneezing, coughing, uh, any kind of valsalving or anything like that that would uh, inadvertently raise uh, the pressure in their eye. Uh, we may, uh, as you know, a, a course of getting them ready to be evaluated, uh, pop anesthetics in their eyes um, and eventually put antibiotic ointments and other ointments in their eyes um, as uh, for the treatment while they're in the department and then as we're getting ready for any kind of aftercare. Uh, eye irrigation, we're going to talk about that, particularly for chemical injuries in a little bit and what that means. Um, eye patching, um, not done with nearly the frequency that it was done in years past. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, eye patching really now is a way of immobilizing or splinting the eye. And that would really be for something that's more like a penetrating object to the eye or something like that. We used to patch corneal abrasions all the time. We don't do that anymore. Um, and then ultimately get the patient ready for either a transfer, if it's a uh, uh, needs higher level care, uh, a referral, um, or any kind of a consultant who might have to come down, ophthalmology or um, oral 
um, uh, oral maxillofacial people who may come down and uh, have to be consultants on the patient. And then ultimately, the vast majority of these patients are discharged from the emergency department. So level of discharge teaching and making sure they understand what their follow-up plans are is going to be very important. So that's the gist of what we need to know. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes and talk a little bit about some of the injuries <clears throat> that we can encounter. The first one we're going to encounter and probably the most common um, injury that you'll encounter uh, with patients coming into the ED um, are the subconjunctile hematomas. Um, these are extremely frequent. I've seen these quite a bit. Um, probably all of you have seen them. Maybe some of you have even inadvertently developed a subconjunctival uh, hematoma at some point in your life. Um, usually the mechanism of injury is fairly simplistically either some blunt force injury to the eye. The vast majority of them are spontaneous. So it's a matter of somebody who sneezed or coughed or valsalvid. Uh, we see this uh, when I was in college. I was um, an intercollegiate uh, weightlifter. We saw this a lot in that environment with people from straining from lifting weights. Um, they would pop essentially um, a blood vessel in the conjunctival area and um, boom. That blood would then lather out between um, the, the epidermal layer, the conjunctiva, and the sclera, and looks a lot worse than it actually is. And it's I've never seen one that's painful uh, in all my years. I do know that they can be, um, but typically it looks worse than it actually is. It's one of those things that makes your eyes water when you look at it, but the patients are actually doing pretty, pretty well. They are almost always benign, but not always benign. Um, you can get some conjunctival swelling with these, particularly if it's a large bleed. And this can actually form what's called a corneal dullen or a dimple. And what that actually is, is in the cornea itself, you'll see that you've got some corneal swelling um, that's going, or some conjunctival swelling that's going on here, but you'll see an area here that's dimpled out, that for whatever reason, the swelling didn't get under um, the, uh, the, the, the cornea here. And as a result, you end up with a dimpling effect. And the significance of that is that when the eyelid comes down and closes and lubricates the surface of the eye, this dimple is below the surface of that lubrication and it won't get lubricated. And it actually has a risk of actually drying out. And when that happens, you can actually get a perforation of the cornea. So certainly when they're being evaluated by physician or mid-level, they're going to be, we're looking specifically at, is there any swelling of the um conjunctival area. And if there is, is there's a dimpling effect. And again, it's not the worst thing in the world. If we identify it, then typically what we'll do is we'll just do, you know, external lubrication. Usually erythromycin uh, ointment is prescribed. They'll put them on a the prescribed course of that until they follow up with an ophthalmologist at the next day or maybe 48 hours down the road. And then typically as the swelling of the conjunctiva goes down, so will the delin go the way of the dodo and, and go away. Um, it is important to make sure, though, that they understand if we're giving them um, a script or a tube of lubricant, how it goes on, how it's applied, and more ardently the importance of them following up uh, to make sure they do not have any complications of their issue. Um, again, I have not personally seen this happen. Um, I talked to a few people in preparation for this and have and, and they did tell me, yes, they have seen these, but pretty rare for them to occur. But hey, look, you know, even the most minor injuries can have some potentially severe complications. So that is that for subconjunctival hematomas. Moving on, another extremely common uh, injury to the eye is the corneal abrasion. We've probably all seen them at some point in time in our, in our practice, um, usually direct injury to the eye, blood force trauma, it's localized to the cornea, it's a scratch to the cornea, if you will. You know, we all know that on the surface of our skin, there's epithelial, there's an epithelial layer, and the epithelial layer extends not only to our skin, but also over our eyes. So anything that gets in our eyes and causes a, a, uh, a scratch or an abrasion across that epithelial layer will result in a corneal abrasion. Usually we visualize this uh, handedly using a ultraviolet or a blue light. Uh, the ultraviolet light we used to use was called a woods lamp. Um, and what we'll do first is we'll stain the eye with a fluorescein stain. 
Um, this can be done either by eye drops or the preferential way of doing it is with a fluorescein strip. Um, the reason the drops are not always preferential is because when the drops go in, they leave a lot of dye, residual dye in the eyes. And sometimes it just makes it a little bit more difficult to fully visualize the entire cornea. Um, but you still can. It just have to, you know, work work your way around it. But the strips work pretty well. You just take the strip, you put it down in the in, in, in the inner canthus, uh, let their tears kind of carry the dye up and over the cornea, and voila, you see the magic once you put that blue light on there. Uh, it's been interesting because I actually saw a MacGyvered thing on YouTube, of course, where one of the docs had taken, literally, he took his cell phone and the flash and the light over his cell phone. He put a piece of clear plastic taped over it and then took a blue marker and just scribbled blue across it and created his own blue light. And it worked really, really well for visualizing uh, these corneal abrasions. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um the fortunate thing about corneal abrasions, and, and, and if you've ever taken care of a patient, you know, they come in, their eyes are really irritated. They can be in a tremendous amount of discomfort. They keep wanting to reach up and rub their eye, and that can just make things worse. Um, but the good thing is, is re-epithelialization re occurs pretty quickly. And usually within about 24 to 48 hours, the corneal abrasion is usually significantly healed, if not entirely healed. Uh, we do have to be careful in patients with those multiple comorbid comorbidities that will slow the healing process, you know, bad diabetes, uh, immunocompromised, things like that. Um, but really, normally, treatment is really kind of fairly straightforward. It's don't rub your eyes. Um, possibly an antibiotic ointment may be prescribed again if it's a particularly large abrasion or they've got comorbidities that may predispose them to developing an infection. They will sometimes get uh, topical antibiotics. Uh, we don't send them home with topical anesthetics because we know that the more anesthetic they put in their eye, their eye numbs up and then they go to, 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 to rub their eye and they can't feel it. And they create another abrasion. Um, if they're wearing contact lenses, then contact lenses are taboo, at least until they're followed up, typically by ophthalmology. And usually follow up is 36, depending on what the time of the day and time of the week is, 36 to about 48 hours post uh, visit in the emergency department um, if they are going to go that route. So again, pretty straight stuff. Uh, again, uh, we don't do patching of the eyes anymore. I can remember a time that we did patch the eyes and we had to do, you know, education on what the depth of field changes were going to be because they had a patched eye and they couldn't drive and things like that. But uh, the test of time and some studies have, have shown that there's a, they, there appears to possibly be a higher than acceptable uh, risk of infection from the eye patch. The eye patch creates a nice, moist, warm environment over the abrasion and can breed bacteria uh, growth and increases the risk of infection from it. So you don't typically see eye patching being done very often, if at all, anymore. So that's a corneal abrasion. All right, the dastardly chemical exposure. This is this is a true, true ophthalmologic emergency. So ascertaining the type of chemical is important. So look, if you are in the if you're in your layperson mode, you're at home and somebody gets some liquid in their eye, your neighbor gets something splashed in their eye and comes running over and says, Hey, I just got some stuff splashed in my eye. What do I do? Um do not pass go, do not collect two hundred dollars. We go right to irrigating the eye. Very, very important that we do that. Um, if we can, while we're getting them set up and while we're getting ready to irrigate their eye, we can ascertain the type of chemical that they got splashed in their eye. That's good. If they are coming from a workplace exposure, industrial exposure, the good news is, is that very often we can find out what the chemical is because OSHA requires um, MSDS sheets to be at the site of all compliant businesses. So uh, whether or not we get them ahead of time, um, which we've actually gotten, we've actually had companies that had employees that were exposed. They were put in the pickup truck or the vehicle and sent to the ER. But while they were being sent, they faxed uh, back in the old days, faxed over a copy of the um, MSDS sheet, or they they rolled it up and stuck it in the pocket of the patient, and we could have it when when they arrived, so we could find out what chemical it was. What we're really worried about is trying to figure out the acidity or the alkalinity of the chemical when they come in. And what we're particularly worried about is the alkalinity. And the reason for that is alkaline exposures to the eyes are more devastating than acid exposures as a general rule. There are some acids that are out there that can be really dastardly when they get into your eye. But as a general rule, it's the alkali injuries. It's those very high pH 
uh, chemicals that get in there. And the reason for that is in the eye, these alkali uh, chemicals will can cause a liquefaction necrosis of the cornea. So they can go in very, very deep and be very destructive to the cornea. Okay. Um, and there are a, very, a variety of other chemicals that may be uh, pH neutral, but can also become problematic. But trying to ascertain the chemicals is somewhat helpful. Doing a gross assessment, guess what? It's going to have to be really, really rapid because if they walk in the door of the ED or they come in by ambulance and EMS hasn't already been irrigating their eyes, which they should, then we need to promptly get them a new room and start irrigating their eyes. What is good to see while you're getting them set up is red irritated eyes. That's a good sign. It tells you the chemical is irritating superficially at this point in time. Um, what's not good is if you see pallor to and around the eye and particularly fogging of the cornea like you see in this picture. Um, that's a bad sign and we don't want to see that. We're trying to prevent that from happening by irrigating the eye as quickly as possible. Again, immediate eye irrigation is extremely important. They certainly teach us in the pre-hospital setting uh, that you irrigate the eye as quickly as possible and use anything that you can that isn't more detrimental than what they got in their eye. So whether or not you're using some normal saline or sterile water or using even a bottle of water that you've got of Poland Springs or DeSante or Wegmans or whatever, um, start irrigating the eye as quickly as possible. If possible, a topical anesthetic can go in. It certainly does make it a little bit easier on the patient when it comes to discomfort. Um, but again, no delay in getting this in. And then irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. Extremely important. Irrigation techniques vary widely. And I'm sure each of us on the phone, if we've taken care of these patients and you've done an eye irrigation for either, you know, a chemical exposure or something like that, we all have our own little stories of how things were done. Um, you can do a variety of things. This particular one shows a nice little kidney basin and somebody that looks like a sippy cup is getting, I hope that's not apple juice, going into that person's eye and irrigating them out. Up here, we've got the old bulb syringe technique. Wow, it's kind of from a, throw, a, a bygone day, but at least they're wearing gloves here. This looks really old. We're not even wearing gloves here. There's a kidney base in this metal. So this is probably from way back days. Um, and then, of course, we're all probably familiar with the Morgan lens and probably the most seamless way to be able to irrigate an eyes to a Morgan lens or a device like that. Um, or in the true spirit of MacGyver, there's always the nasal cannula that can uh, be put up over the bridge of their nose and you can irrigate uh, through that as well. If you only have to irrigate one eye, then you can get a hemostat and just clamp off uh, one of the prongs for the nasal cannula. Or I've seen one where they put both prongs over the eye and just taped to the forehead and went along that route if they either couldn't find a Morgan lens or didn't have one. This is, tends to be something we do more in the pre-hospital setting. Um, and I'll set this up in the back of my ambulance on a couple of times I've had to irrigate eyes. Um, and in, in most cases, it was both eyes. Um, I've set this up and it, and it does work nicely, except the person has to keep their eyes open physically, which is a problem. And as we all know, when you got the Morgan lens and it goes in, they can lay back, they can relax and they just let that water kind of run over their eyes. Irrigation solution of choice, look, it really doesn't make any difference for self-care or for buddy care. Before you get them into the hospital, any fluid, again, any kind of a, a liquid, you know, whether it's water, or whether it's, you know, normal saline, sterile water, whatever. Uh, in hospital, the stuff, we it doesn't make any difference. You can use lactated rigors or normal saline. You know, the, the thing is that, you know, normal saline, and most of us don't realize it, is how acidic normal saline is. I mean, with a pH of 5.5, if you've got somebody who's got an acid in their eye, then I don't think I'd be necessarily advocating throwing something in their eye that has a lower pH. But again, not that big a deal. Lactated ringers, again, a little bit more neutral pH, but still a little on the acidic side. Um, so again, things to think about there. But any of these work very, very nicely. Uh, the question then becomes, after you're popping this up and you got the irrigation going on, is how much irrigation do I need to do, right? And probably for some of us, it's also how do we deal with the, uh, the flow out of water or fluids when it comes out of the eye? 
Um, I know that they've got some nice little devices out there that you can purchase that, you know, they channel channels the water into a, a waste basket. Um, I was great at just patting the person down with, with, with chucks and just letting the water absorb into the chucks and just had to, somebody had to be there periodically to pull the, pull the wet chuck off and put a dry chuck on whatever the case would be. Um, but you want to irrigate them until you believe you've got enough irrigate in there to be able to dilute out and thwart off whatever chemical they got into their eye. So as a general rule, about a liter to begin with goes into their eye. If after you do that liter, they're still having a tremendous amount of irritation, then we'll pop another liter on board. Um, once we're done and once we've at least got some irrigation on board, we're going to need to check their eye pH. Um, typically, you want to wait about five to 10 minutes after the irrigation is done uh, for the eye to rebalance itself and for you to get an actual uh, somewhat accurate eye pH. Normal IPH is right at about seven, ranges 6.5 to 7.5. And we're going to basically use a litmus paper for that, litmus down into the uh, intercanthus, hold it there for a few seconds so that you absorb some of the tears and some of the fluid off the eye and then compare it to the um, the the, uh, the color ribic uh, comparison chart that is on the side of the litmus uh, paper. So, you know, important to do that. After a liter or two, if you have achieved normal pH and the patient is not symptomatic and not complaining of anything, life can be good. But I've had a couple in my own experiences, we've had bad alkaline injuries that have come in and we have done, I think my personal best, we did close to about 15 liters of uh, lactated rigors uh, on an eye before we got the uh, the patient to calm down, we got stabilization of the pH and more importantly, the patient became less symptomatic. So you know, again, you can do a lot of irrigating and, and sometimes it does take a lot. Already answered that. And then afterwards, typically it's wise to assess for corneal abrasion. Again, you know, you've stuck a Morgan lens in their eye, you stuck a, a nasal cannula in their eye or something, and you just want to make sure you didn't scratch their cornea afterwards. So it's not uncommon. Once you've stabilized it out, stick some fluorescein stain in there and make sure there isn't an abrasion to boot on top of it all. And then arrange for appropriate follow-up, okay? You know, a lot of times these cases don't require a tremendous amount of follow-up, but I think the uh, the better part of Valor is if you have a follow-up program in your department or and or a referral out to an ophthalmologist or even their own uh, personal uh, practitioner, then that's probably a, a good plan to, to have. All right. How about metal foreign bodies in the eye? Why are these bad? Well, first of all, it's metal in the eye, and that's never any good, right? But more ardently with these things, when metal gets in there, they get into your eye, what is going to happen when you get metal and water kind of coming together? It's never going to be good, right? It's going to be rust, and we're going to talk about that in a second. So the common mechanism of injury here is I tend to call it as something that's more tends to be more industrial or work related. It's people that are working on things like metal grinding tools in a mechanic shop um, in an industry where they may have some shards or some plummeting of metal and they're not wearing appropriate eye safety devices and they end up getting a shard of metal or a speck of metal in their eye. Uh, see this a lot with what I like to call weekend warrior injuries. It's guy, me, out in my workshop, in my garage, grinding away a metal. Maybe I'm sharpening a knife or a screwdriver on a grinder, and I'm not wearing, again, appropriate uh, safety goggles, and I get a piece of, of metal flips up and goes into my eye. That's the vast majority of these. Problem is metal gets into there, adheres pretty tightly to the cornea, and it can start to rust very, very quickly. Treatment is really to facilitate as quick a removal as possible. How are we going to do that? Well, here's one example of, of, of an ophthalmologist. You get basically got an 18 gauge needle, numbed up the eye, and then went at it. And you, what you gotta do is get in there and try to flick that piece of metal off as quickly as possible. And you'll see, even in this case, we'll up the magnification here, he got in there, he was able to flip it off, but it, you'll see that it still left behind kind of a little bit of a rust residue. He then went in with what appears to be a Q-tip after that, 
and he kind of kind of tried to wipe away as much of that rust residue as possible. And you really want to do that because if not, you can get a permanent rust discoloration ring to the eye. And more ardently, the rust, if you leave a lot of residual rust behind, it actually can go deeper into the cornea and actually penetrate into the eye and cause some injuries. In particular, it can injure the retinal photoreceptors and cause some potential eye damage down the road. Um, Another thing that's, uh, that that sometimes uh, the docs or the providers will follow up on is sometimes if they think there could be the potential for more metal in the eye that they're not able to visualize, then they may get a CT of the orbit uh, to make sure they don't see any other little pieces of metal fragments that they didn't otherwise miss by uh, by uh, gross uh, visual exam or even through slit lamp, slit lamp exam. And then antibiotics are a good course with them. Again, just because you do not want to get an infection and you do not want to have these rust uh, rings create issues down the road. So uh, a topical antibiotic, it's not unusual for that to be prescribed. All right, let's get into a little bit more dastardly eye problem and that's the ruptured globe. So this is by de by definition a full thickness injury to the sclera, the cornea, or both. You typically are going to find the person does have some tanned amount of visual loss, whether it's complete visual loss or it's uh, significant visual loss. Really depends on the degree of rupture. It does become a portal of entry for infection, so that becomes problematic. If we end up with a complete globe rupture, which means the globe loses its ability to maintain some level of continuity it'll start to misshapen and that'll become problematic. Um, if you're assessing these patients, you don't palpate the eyeball. You try not to palpate much around the eyeball if you suspect there's a global rupture and you're really gonna facilitate getting ophthalmology in very, very quickly. This picture here really connotates those areas of the eye which may be prone to global rupture. Typically it's gonna be the area, again, between the conjunctiva and, and, and the, um, the lens of the eye, it tends to be a weak point, as well as any of the insertion points for the ocular muscles. And sometimes these will actually pull away and as they pull out, they actually will uh, rip away into the globe, okay? Uh, yeah, mechanism of injury here tends to be blunt trauma. You could also get a ruptured globe, obviously from penetrating trauma as well. Much of this really is facilitating getting this patient back, getting them seen, getting ophthalmology down, and then ultimately um, they'll probably go to the operating room to have these surgically repaired. Global ruptures can be particularly bad, particularly if you end up with the uh, with with the muscle pulling away from its attachment, and leaving pretty large groping holes in the wall of the eyeball that causes it to essentially decompensate. Um, to be really problematic. Again, I and personally, I have not seen any glow. I've not seen a global rupture in come in where it wasn't part of you know severe mid face trauma, and they had a lot of other things going on in addition to the eye being problematic. You know, head injury, facial injury, airway problems, things like that. So, um, I've seen a couple of ruptured globes in that environment, multi trauma. Um, I've not seen anybody come in with an isolated ruptured globe though. Orbital fractures, again, um, not tremendously common, but not uncommon either. So again, should be suspected that anybody with blunt force facial trauma, okay, any kind of injuries that are proximal to the eyes, one of the things that we're going to be doing again as part of our initial assessment is to palpate around the eyes and see if we feel any deformities that can be indicative um, of, of, of a fracture. The anatomy of the eye socket is very, very interesting if you take a look at it. When you get back into the eye socket, it's made up of a series of very small, very thin bones. And these bones are in there and really provide nice continuity to the eye socket, but are extremely friable. And they're friable for a reason. You know, the, 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 the concept of the face and the way the face is constructed, it's really constructed to dissipate energy away from the brain. So if somebody takes a good hit to the face or takes a club across the face or is involved in a motor vehicle crash where they go face into the dashboard, steering wheel, no airbag and or uh, windshield or even like a B post, um, the face really wants to collapse and dissipate energy away and try to preserve the brain. And it does that because we've got air filled sinuses that are in there serving almost like airbags, if you will. 
And then again, the bones are very friable and will take the kinetic energy when it comes in, dissipates across the bone, the bone will fracture. And that pretty much slows, if not stops the energy from being dissipated further into the skull, which is very, very ingenious in the way it's designed. But unfortunately, it means that we're going to get some complications as a result of injuries that occur to the eye socket. Um, again, lots of small bones, very thin. Some of the bones are less than a half a millimeter in thickness, so they're very friable. I mean, you know, honestly, if you pulled somebody's eye out and took your finger and just stuck it in and pressed, you'd probably poke through some of the bones in the medial, the medial aspect of the eye or the infraorbital area. Um, and again, that's just kind of the nature of how um, Mother Nature um, built our faces. And again, we've got uh, air-filled sinuses. Uh, again, to the infraorbital area and medially that again help to dissipate energy away from the brain but again it does create that pocket where you can end up getting a disruption of the bone if you remember when i talked at the very beginning about the lady who came in domestic violence blew her nose and blew up the side of her face well she indeed had an orbital blowout fracture and so she had a nice hole in her medial the medial aspect of her orbit and when she blew her nose the path of least resistance wasn't to come out into the tissue it was to go back up into the subcutaneous tissue or the soft tissue surrounding her eye so, you know, that's what you tend to find there. And that was a pretty ardent physical finding. It didn't take but a new grad to see that happening. So the fracture types and locations do vary a little bit. Um, you can have an orbital rim fracture where, just as the name implies, you end up with a little bit of a step-off fracture that surrounds the orbital rim. You can have injuries to the orbital floor. You can have injuries to the medial aspect of the orbit. And these tend to be called, called what are called blowout fractures. And the blowout fractures in and of themselves are not overly problematic unless they entrap part of the eye or more commonly the eye muscle um, in, their, in their blowout. In, in, as, as the muscle flaps open, blows out, and then as it flaps back down, it catches the eye muscle Usually the eye muscle, not so much the eye, um, it gets entrapped. Um, very common to see somebody that'll come in. They've got very limited upward gaze of their eye. They're seeing double vision. Um, you may even see that their, their affected eye is sunken in a little bit further into their skull than their unaffected eye. It's called enophthalmos. All that is indicative of having uh, part of the eyeball or the musculature of the eyeball entrapped in the, in the, in the orbit itself. Again, uh, it, it, an absolute ophthalmologic emergency, typically not as bad as we saw with a ruptured globe or penetrating object or the rust uh, or the metal to the eye or chemicals. But again, you know, kind of a top five when it comes to, you know, those things that you facilitate getting back and, you know, getting seen by one of our, our providers in the ED, as well as getting a consult uh, up and running to get them in to determine exactly what it is they want to do. Some of these things will end up uh, going to the operating room that night. And I've seen a couple that with uh, relatively minor entrapment where the ophthalmologist was comfortable discharging them, wanted to let some of the swelling go down and then had them come back to the office or clinic the next day where they would then decide how they wanted to deal with it. And in some cases, these things managed to disentrap themselves as swelling went down in about the, in 12, 15, 16 hours after the incident. Um, I've seen more admitted than I've seen sent home though. That's just kind of in, in my own practice. Again, this is what you'll commonly see. You end up doing extraocular motion. You see we've got obviously trauma to her left eye. Um, and you see, as we ask her to look up, her, her right eye goes up, but her left eye kind of goes up and kind of sits there in, in, in a position that doesn't go up any higher. Again, very indicative of um, entrapment. And then also, I don't know how well you can see it in this picture, but you can see the eye here tends to be probably a little bit more sunken into the, uh, to the, to the skull than this eye over here, creating that enophthalmos I talked about. Again, it's entrapped and kind of pulling that muscle and pulling the eye back just a little bit. Retrobulbar hematoma. Wow, this is uh, an interesting one. It's a mouthful to say the least. I threw this in here not because it's common. I mean, these are extremely uncommon. I can probably think of maybe two of these that I can recall seeing in all the years that I've been practicing. Um, but um, you see them. And, and, and what really brought this to my attention is the last time I taught TNCC, one of the distractors in one of the questions that's part of the TNCC lectures talks about a re retrobulbar hematoma. It's not the correct answer, 
but it's there. And everybody always wants to know what this is, which tells you they didn't read the book before coming to class. Um, but, you know, a retrobulbar hematoma really pretty simply is just an accumulation of blood that occurs in the retrobulbar space behind the eyeball. So the best way that I was explained and it made the most sense to me is you take a look at the eye socket, almost like an ice cream cone. The, or, the, the, the eyeball, the globe itself is that big scoop of vanilla or chocolate ice cream on top of a cone, which is somewhat hollow, the retrobulbar space behind the ice cream that sits in that cone. And then you have eye muscles and ligaments that kind of attach and hold the ice cream to the cone, so to speak. So through some things such as blunt force trauma, we see this a lot with explosions. These are like wartime injuries. Um, you'll end up with hemorrhaging that go occurs in that retrobulbar space. It's not a tremendously big space. This is not a large ice cream cone. It's a really small ice cream cone. And as that as that blood builds up behind the eyeball, it presses against the eyeball. And pressing against the eyeball will eventually cause venous compression. It can cause increased intraocular pressure. It can eventually, if untreated, result in decreased arterial blood flow. And all of this then becomes an a, essentially an orbital compartment syndrome. We talk about compartment syndrome of the extremity, abdominal compartment syndrome, well, boom, we have a compartment syndrome that occurs in the eye itself. Now, where that's concerned is, wow, problematic. We also can see a partial or a little bit of a forward displacement or an ex ophthalmos, if you will, of the uh, globe as it protrudes out because of the pressure occurring behind it. But the, the eyeball is only going to go so far. Uh, unlike what you might see on TV, the eye doesn't just like pop out of its socket and just kind of hang there by the optic nerve. It doesn't work that way. It'll push out over to a certain area because we've got muscles and we've got ligaments that hold it in place. Um, but what we can do is get some stretching and some compression on the optic nerve, and that's called proptosis. And all of these things, the confluence of all these events coming together, is, as you can imagine, is not going to be good on the health of the eyeball. This can result in permanent eye loss as quickly as 60 minutes after the injury occurs. So the treatment is what's called a lateral canthotomy. And what we're basically doing is, is that, well, not we're doing, but the docs are doing is they're going in, doing a little bit of an, an incision to the side of the eye, and they're trying to snip the, canth the canthal tendon, which will then allow the eye to actually protrude out. It'll relieve some of the pressure behind the eye. It's not uncommon as they're making the cuts and stuff and the eye protrudes out, you may actually get some of the blood actually relieves itself and comes out as well. And it will relieve the pressure until bleeding stops and blood gets reabsorbed or drains out through the very small incision that they make. Um, the key here is getting an intraocular pressure on the patient and typically it will exceed 40 millimeters of mercury. So let's take a look here. I've got a video. Hopefully this is going to work. If for some reason it doesn't work, if somebody would just pop their mute off and just say, hey, we can't see the video working, then I'll move past it pretty quickly. But hopefully this will work.
All right, I don't know how well the sound came through on that, but even if you didn't have the sound, you kind of got the feel for the procedure from, from looking at it. It is a pretty invasive procedure, but again, it's a sight saving procedure that needs to be done very, very quickly. And I've seen this twice and both times it was done in the emergency department. One time it was done on a multi-trauma patient and the other time it was done on a person who came in uh, after being involved in an altercation where they just took a real good fist to the eye and ended up with this uh, retrobulbar hematoma. So again, not something that is commonplace, but certainly is a site threatening uh, type of an emergency that we can encounter. Hyphema. Um, maybe some of you have seen a hyphema. These are very interesting uh, events when they occur. Basically, what you end up is through, again, through some blunt trauma mechanism, you end up with some gross bleeding in the anterior chamber of the eye. The bleeding is usually from the vessels of the iris or the ciliary bodies themselves uh, that are in the anterior chamber. Uh, interestingly enough, about 70% of the cases that are encountered in emergency departments are usually kids involved with in sporting uh, in injuries, uh, with the majority of them being males, although that's now starting to, to teeter off a little bit, fortunately. With uh, sports most commonly involved include baseball, basketball, soccer, and softball, all of the ball sports where you get hit in the face uh, and blood impact injury from there. Um Typically with a high fema, what you're going to see is a patient will come in. They may or may not be having a lot of pain or a lot of irritation. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. I've seen a number of these in, in history. Sometimes you will see it like in this picture down here, where it's pretty obvious, a lot of blood accumulating into the eye. There's actually a scale that rates it from a very small to almost an entire uh, anterior chamber filling with blood. Um, and, you know, again, you look at it, a lot of times the patients are not necessarily complaining of a lot of stuff, at least in my experience, and, or they're explaining of maybe periorbital pain from soft tissue injury. This is where the slit lamp becomes very handy. Uh, you'll see there's some fluorescein staining that was done here. Again, we want to look out for a contaminant, a contaminant uh, corneal abrasion. Um, and then generally speaking, we're going to get, we're going to check their IOP. We're going to see what their intraocular pressure is. If their IOP is in the normal range. And if you remember from the beginning, we talked between 10 and 20 millimeters of mercury, and it's a relatively small bleed, then they're usually uh, referred out to follow up. But the docs may put them on topical steroids or topical uh, muscle relaxants, essentially, that'll help uh, kind of keep the uh, the ciliary muscles from spasming and possibly causing a re-bleed. The other thing that's interesting is that you may get a buildup of blood in here, and as the blood becomes resorbed, they may end up having a re-bleed three to five days after the initial hyphema. So very often when they are sent out for uh, follow-up, it's usually th about three to five days after they've been seen in the ED um, that they'll come back for follow-up. That's a hyphema. All right, so that kind of rounds off, if you will, some of the stuff that we talked about. There's some of the references I looked at, in particular, this Optho book, which is available on YouTube. Uh, if you go on YouTube and you just look for Tim Root, T-I-M-R-O-O-T, -O -O he does. He has a phenomenal uh, tutorial on, on eye emergencies. And a lot of the ones you see here tonight, I pilfered off of him. Um, but I've also got a couple of other references up here. I am a huge fan of MRAP, so I don't know if any of you have heard of MRAP. It's Emergency Medicine Reviews and Perspectives. Um, I was fortunate enough to, in Patterson, we had um, Annette Swanee Nathan, who's one of the lead editors or commentators for MRAP. It's pretty expensive to subscribe to this, but the plethora of information you get out of MRAP is phenomenal. But if you go on YouTube, they put a lot of their their videos up on YouTube, and they're excellent videos to watch. Um, so I wholeheartedly recommend that. So what I'm going to do now, which right at about a little bit, about nine o'clock, just want to open up the floor here real quick. I'm going to bring my screen share off for a moment. And just uh, anybody that wants to have, if you have any comments or questions or pearls of wisdom of your own practices, you know, now would be a good time to share them if you are so inclined. Again, not going to make you do it. The other thing that I'll ask of you, just if you wouldn't mind, uh, since I know a couple of you, but not all of you, if you just wouldn't mind in the chat box, just putting your, your what institution you're from, just so I get a feel for kind of who's out there and, and, and where you're from. Um, I would appreciate it. But does you know, anybody have any questions or comments?
Ah, community, very good, excellent. Yep, ask away. All right, Jersey City, the inner city. Hey, Renee, how are you? All right, so while that's cooking, let me very quickly, oop, I just lost something. I got to get my stuff back up here. Boom. I'm going to share my screen with you again here. Boom. All right. So um, with this, the next slide here. Boom. All right. So uh, claiming your credit. So do me a favor. If you are so inclined, just kind of let me know what you thought of tonight. Um, and uh, if you want to scan this QR code, that would be great. If you don't have a scanning tool, let me quickly pop this into the chat and I'll give you a link um, for this. Uh, Laura Lee asked a question, do the nurses put the Morgan lens in or the physicians? In my experience, and again, it's going back a number of years, but the nurses absolutely put them in or the docs put them in too. Um, you know, sometimes while the docs was, doc was doing the evaluation, we're setting up the IV bag, getting the fluid run through the Morgan lens, a couple of eye drops go in and boom, we'll pop it in. So it really depends. I don't know if anybody else who's on here, either Victoria or Caitlin, if you've got any experience with the Morgan lens and who does it at your institution, if you've ever been involved with the procedure, but um, I've done it plenty of times myself. So certainly was a nursing procedure where, where I was, where I, where I come from. You are welcome. So that being said, um, next session, I put a QR code up for that. If you really want to get ahead of the pack and you want to go on and register right now for the next session, which is, again, a very interesting topic, uh, gender diverse and transgender patients as a special population in trauma care. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, when we think of special populations, we're thinking of pediatrics and OB and bariatric and things like that. But, you know, transgender is a is a growing population. I think right now, uh, Justin told me about 7% of the population identifies as transgender with a significant portion of them um, undergoing uh, surgery uh, to to to. To, to gender switch. So that being said, they certainly do have some interesting uh, things to, uh, some interesting uh, remedies and uh, Justin will come on board and uh, talk a little bit about that in, in June. So, um, so again, if you are so inclined, uh, you know, go ahead and click on that QR code. Um, I will also send out to all of you, if you, in your evaluation, if you click that you want to be kind of me to like, uh, stalk you um, on email, um, I'll send you a copy of this uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but other than that, that's it for the night. Um, again, I hope that you found this information helpful to you. What's uh, And I hope, I hope that's the case. If you do have any questions after the fact, don't hesitate to reach out to me. There's my email address. Um, and like I said, what I will do tonight is, or do probably tomorrow, is I'll take this video, we'll render it up, I'll post it up on YouTube and I'll send all of you a link. That way, if you want to reference back to it, to watch it again, uh -huh, yeah, right. Or if you want to push it out to any of your colleagues or anybody you know that might be interested, uh, please do so. Uh, for about the next two or three weeks, as it's posted on YouTube, I'll keep the survey open. So anybody who comes on and does the YouTube version could still claim an hour of CE credit. Um, usually after about a week or two, or about two weeks, I'll close it down because Usually we're not getting a lot of people that are putting in for credit. So um, other than that, I thank you all for your time tonight. Uh, go about your business and be safe out there. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the next installment of Topics in Trauma Nursing. So take care and have a good night. Thank you, Steve. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Renee.